Hello and welcome uh, to this IFL webinar on uh, IFL's digital research literacy training program outline for librarians. So we have um, three excellent uh, speakers today. Uh, David Ball uh, from David Ball Consulting uh, will uh, introduce us to research data management uh, as a topic. Then we'll have Obrat uh, Kovac from uh, Windsor Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Serbia. And um, he will share his uh, training approaches on research data management. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Samuel Simango, research data services manager at Stellenbosch University Library. Uh, who will talk about uh, a research data management adventure game that they recently launched uh, and about skills development through game-based learning. So it's a very interesting and busy program today. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. And uh, thank you, David Obrat and Samuel, for being with us. And uh, over to you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, train, training session. Um, my name is David Ball, a uh, bit of background. Uh, I was university librarian at Bournemouth uh, for about 14 years and, and did a lot of work in terms of uh, moving to electronic resources, including the institutional repository. I worked on a couple of uh, major uh, European Union programs, uh, PASTA for OA and FOSTA, about which we will hear a little more later. And I also spent a year in Uganda and did a bit of work with the consortium of, of Uganda University Libraries there, and have worked as a consultant in the, in the UK and in, in, in Europe. So that's me. What I'm going to talk about this morning, firstly, uh, is uh, open data and its complexities. It is much more complex uh, because of the, the nature of the data, of the input and of the requirements uh, than, for instance, open access. And it takes a lot, a lot more specialism to, to uh, deal with open data, hence uh, this, these extensive programs that IFL has, has produced. I'll also talk a bit about uh, Open Data Champions, which uh, were, was developed uh, by Spark Europe, and which is a very useful resource if you're, if you're training uh, and educating uh, researchers, for instance. And uh, I'll say a little bit about the resources provided in the IFL training program. So definitions first. Research data can be defined simply as whatever is either produced in research or evidences research outputs. The European Commission has a definition, of course, which is information in particular facts and numbers collected to be examined and considered and as a basis for reasoning, discussion or calculation. Now that does uh, tend to look a little bit like uh, scientific or technical data but, but the definition is actually much wider than that. Um, as we can see uh, from the uh, examples, um, they are, for instance, statistics as we're already aware of, but also observations from fieldwork, surveys, and so on and so forth. We, Gen generally, we are now seeing the, the, the uh, emergence of research data policies. They vary, of course, as uh, do all policies across different institutions. But they will generally, generally follow, the, follow these elements. Firstly, timing. When should publication actually take place? Is this during the research, at the end of the research period? on publication of any associated open access articles, or when? Or should there perhaps be a, a, um, an embargo as well? The data plan, the, 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 there is a, a requirement for a technical, technical management plan for all data. 
and also access and sharing. What exactly will need to be available for public use? What is not available for public public use? What is what is kept uh, private? Long-term curation. Uh, we are talking here not about uh, having some having uh, a, a, something stuck away in the drawer of of, uh, of a researcher, but something which is open and ready for use and should be kept open for a decent length of time. Also, any monitoring that will have to be carried out as a, as a, as a requirement of the funding. Uh, storage where details of the appropriate re re repository or data center to be used. There are exemptions. Uh, the Euro European Commission has a very useful motto. Uh, open data, data should be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. This is, is perhaps, perhaps the, the, the most uh, the pithy way of uh, defining what open data should be. There have to be exemptions. Um, for instance, uh, if the data has a potential co commercial value, uh, then obviously the, the producers will want to keep it to themselves until they have made that, uh, uh, turned it into a patent or some other form of, uh, of, commercially, of commercial value. It must be compatible with the need for confidentiality in connection with security issues. Uh, obviously, if research has been taking place in terms of uh, anti-terrorism or, 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 or forces, armed forces, uh, then that will need to be kept confidential. And also, of course, with uh, personal data, it must, must not be possible uh, to identify individuals' uh, personal, personal data. So that has to be, has to be hidden. Uh, there may also be a case for an, an embargo where the, the which will ex, can ex, can expire after a, after a short time, but still needs to be kept uh, secret for a, a, a certain length of time. The European, uh, sorry, the, the, the UK uh, funding bodies have produced this concordat. That is not only, I believe, the uh, uh, government funding bodies, but also bodies such as the Wellcome Trust. The, the aim of the con con concordat is to ensure that so the research data gathered and, and generated by members of the UK com research community is available for use by others wherever possible in a manner consistent with relevant legal, ethical and regulatory frameworks and norms. And also to establish a set of expectations of good practice in the area. Uh, so that, uh, that what the, the, the research which was, which was carried out as a result of, of funding by government, by taxpayers, or by donors to charity is, is made available uh, to others working in the field or in, or in, or in different fields. The con Concordat uh, con continues to say, say that uh, to give an a wild, rather wider definition of what uh, research data actually are uh, than, was, than, we, than we've just seen. They are that defined as the evidence that underpins the answer to the research question and can be used to validate findings regardless of its form. And examples include statistics, digital images, uh, transcripts of interviews, survey data and field work, observations, but also not, so that we, we are seeing this being not only uh, confined to uh, technical, scientific and medical uh, data, uh, but also to data with, which are in the social sciences and humanities fields. So for instance, a, a, an artwork, uh, pub a published text or a, or a manuscript. Uh, these are all examples of what can be seen as uh, research data. So it's not just science and technology. Force 11 has uh, pr promulgated these four 
fair data principles. Firstly, find, findability. It must be easy to find the data and the metadata or by both humans and com computers, and should, the data should hence have pers persistent identifiers. Accessible. Data should be retrievable by the, their identifier using a standardized and open communications protocol. So again, this is not something which is hidden behind uh, a piece of bespoke software. Interoperable. The data should be able to com be combined with and used with other data or tools. Again, this is, this is a, a function of open source, uh, for instance, uh, 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 data should also be reusable. Uh, metadata and data should be well described so it can be replicated and or combined in different settings. So those are the four FAIR principles. Spark Europe has uh, identified some data champions. Data champions are a very valuable resource in teaching and in reaching and convincing researchers in a very practical way. They are not uh, librarians, they are existing experienced researchers who have the respect of their research community. So they are, are an excellent resource uh, for, for us uh, to use to reach other academics and researchers. The 16 researchers uh, were surveyed uh, and interviewed by Spark Europe and they their uh, expertise, uh, their, uh, their, their, their championing um, was collected together and is, uh, and is archived on that, on the, at the URL that you see there. They were from a variety of disciplines and from seven different European countries. It is, so it is very worthwhile uh, to take some time to read through uh, the results of the interviews with these researchers and you can find here uh, arguments or examples based on the actual their actual research activity across a wide uh, spectrum uh, of disciplines the next few slides give a flavor of the content of the uh, research of the of the uh, data champions in terms of rationales, uh, again, they, they feel that data should be produced as data, any data produced as a result of, of public funding or charity funding should be publicly available. This is a theme that, that runs through, throughout, so open science, of course. It is only possible to validate or reproduce research find, findings if the underlying data and tools are available. Uh, this, so this goes beyond peer review. Uh, which generally only will, will have uh, the, the the paper to be to be to be published, uh, but instead, or uh, in addition, the the underlying data and tools allow a, a, a great degree of validation. Uh, it was in the independent research groups around the world uh, seem to be uh, creating their own uh, collections of data. And obviously, this is inefficient if there is duplication in terms of uh, the different, the, the same data or the same sort of data being being collected. Data can often be reused, for instance, being subject to different methodologies or coupled with other data. And alone, that makes that open data makes available possible the creation of very large data sets. Actions to be taken, uh, recommended by, by the champions, uh, say that the, there has to be a change in research culture so that sharing data becomes the norm. And this, of course, it depends on the motiv motivation researchers, for, for instance, through academic incentives. Cult widespread cultural change, uh, as, as we're talking about here, uh, must be can be speeded up and and by you, the uh, support of senior managers and researchers. So we, we, when policies are made, they, they should not be hidden away in someone's drawer and only looked at again in, in a few years. 
uh, they must be actively encouraged and, and promoted uh, by senior staff in, in, in the individual institutions. Funders' policies, of course, can uh, play a, a significant role as they can in terms of open access. Um, and uh, open data, as with all open science, uh, is, should, become, should not become something separate. It should become an integral part of researchers' education. And it must, as we know from uh, the, the open access world, we, it must be made as easy as possible for researchers to deposit and share their data. The vision of the champions for the future um, say that knowledge creation will be accelerated, producing real world be benefits, particularly for medicine. And we, we have seen this in operation very much in the, in the current uh, uh, crisis of the pandemic. Uh, it should also be possible to draw on in, uh, or incorporate uh, large data, data sets, for instance, uh, with meteorology uh, or, me, or transport. And the, the, ready available, uh, uh, the, the must be ready availability of, of data with appropriate metadata. And that should help drive the interdisciplinary approach to research. So that was something about the, the open data champions. And as I said, do go and have a, have a trawl through uh, their, uh, uh, their knowledge and use, use it in your, in your own training, training programs. Now, the content of the program that uh, Eiffel has put together is a very wide ranging with different formats, uh, which you can use and customize to your own to your own purposes. They are for use with different audiences, for trainers, library staff, uh, researchers, managers, a wide range of people. And a lot of, there's a lot of content within the documents, uh, such as videos and webinars. Uh, and it is, a, it is worthwhile individual, individuals del delving down to find relevant elements. Certain highlights, uh, all the materials are re or referenced are excellent and rich in content. And the following are selected some selected highlights, uh, given the fact that we don't have very long this morning. And of course, URLs will given in the course outline. There are mentioned five short courses produced by the European funded Foster project, which I mentioned earlier on. They are very comprehensive and can be followed as an accredited course. There is also a five week course create, created by the University of Edinburgh, uh, some of the leading experts in, in, in the field of data. And this is, they, they're also a very high standard and uh, are, are accredited. Also, also made available are about 20 examples of practical tips and guides and so forth from several institutions such as Open Air. And these can be used for, for direct usage or as an inspiration. There's also a, a comprehensive ebook as available as a PDF free of charge, engaging researchers with data management by a, a number of very well respected con con contributors. Finally, a word about uh, embedding open science. So the, the materials made available are a, a key to winning the hearts and minds within institutions. But open science needs to, needs to be embedded. Firstly, in academic and research policies with the committed backing of senior management. In decisions on researchers' appraisal and progression, only papers or data deposited in repositories should count for progression. In the research and academic committees of the, universe, of the institution and in the involvement of champions, external and external, and in the, work, in the workflows of researchers supported by library staff. That's all I have to uh, say to you at the moment. Um, 
back to you, Irina. Thanks a lot, David. Sir. It was very useful. Um, I, I don't see any burning questions yet. Sir. And when we when were you talk when you were talking about uh, data champions, I asked in the chat whether colleagues also have open data champions in their institutions and some responded that they don't have uh, yet but i think it's it's really a good way to engage with researchers yeah. identifying those who already practice responsible data sharing and uh, collaborate with them um, so then we'll move on and uh, over to you Obrat, sir to share your training approaches um, okay Okay, I hope you see it now just to make it full screen. Yeah, I hope you can see and uh, hear yes. me well. Yes, just a second, just to minimize this. Okay, uh, hello once again uh, to all. Uh, uh, my name is Obra Butkovac and I come from Vincher Institute of Nuclear Sciences from the library there. And uh, I will share my experiences, uh, my experiences and uh, colleagues from the uh, team we formed about uh, responsible managing and uh, sharing uh, research data. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I will just look upon a, a situation in Serbia now. Uh, uh, the network of uh, people involved in uh, open science and uh, teaching, educating open science and dealing with national policies is uh, more and more growing and the situation is uh, rapidly developing now, it's very good. Um, it, thanks, it is mostly thanks to the projects uh, like uh, Be Open, which was funded by Erasmus Plus and uh, also projects like uh, from Open Air and finance, but by Open Air and uh, NIFOS from uh, the Open Open Science Cloud. Uh, projects like this uh, uh, made uh, significant results like uh, past and uh, very good uh, repositorization of um, uh, Serbian uh, research institute institutions. Uh, and also, uh, it, uh, uh, one of the most important results was the uh, Open Science Platform, which is uh, our national open science policy. And in that uh, policy, it states that uh, there is a, a, a section for uh, research uh, articles and uh, what should be with data, how it uh, should be managed to be open, open, uh, open access. And uh, but also it uh, deals with uh, research data. And uh, for now, it is only a requirement, uh, oh, sorry, a, a recommendation uh, to be uh, uh, opened. Uh, but uh, it follows uh, basically uh, uh, recommendations by European Commission on that particular matter. Um, all these. Uh, Initiatives and projects dealt with uh, mostly with open access uh, to research articles and uh, infrastructure, uh, but uh, research data management was uh, not that considered like like uh, the, the previous parts. Uh, but uh, things starting to change uh, a little bit a few years ago when a science fund, a new research, uh, a new national research funder was uh, funded. And uh, in uh, last uh, year, uh, they, in two calls, they uh, asked uh, for researchers who applied for those calls, for those projects uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, send them uh, what will be the, future of uh, research data that uh, they will generate and use through uh, the, those projects. And in a way they required the DMPs and uh, uh, things started to, uh, uh, to go faster from there. So uh, a little, uh, sometime before that uh, we uh, uh, um, 
we created a, a small team which, which we later called Serbia RDM and um, and uh, we uh, figure out that uh, this will be uh, 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 the next topic, which will be very interesting to work with uh, and uh, to talk about in uh, Serbia. It is not very well um, uh, engaged with. So uh, this team is the uh, the worst. Um, uh, it is a small team, uh, just uh, now uh, five or six members. Uh, it is uh, made of uh, 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 one researcher from uh, that is Liliana Lazaric from uh, Institute of Psychology and uh, from University of, University of Belgrade. Also, uh, Nadeza Mirkovic, uh, who is uh, uh, associate professor from School of Electronic uh, uh, Engineering, and uh, two librarians, uh, Mirica Shekushic, you all very well know, uh, she's very active here in April and uh, from Institute of Technical Sciences and uh, myself. And uh, the latest member is uh, uh, Vladimir Otašević from uh, University of Belgrade Computer Center, who is IT specialist and uh, very much involved in building this, uh, this uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so our first kind of informal gathering was in, in uh, a conference in the November 2019. Uh, the conference is PSOH or, or in English, application of free software and open hardware, where we uh, had this uh, workshop on uh, research data management. It was very, very well received by uh, researchers and uh, students. And uh, so uh, in the beginning of two, uh, 2020, when uh, this new research uh, funder uh, asked for writing of DMPs, uh, we were called by University of Novi Sad and uh, where we gave our uh, lectures there on th this topic and uh, it was very uh, interesting and uh, th there was a lot of discussion after the workshop and uh, a lot of debates. And uh, after that, we had an uh, in-house uh, uh, workshop with uh, Milica's Institute of Technical Sciences in Serbia Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, and uh, uh, the last uh, workshop in this uh, format was uh, in uh, for Institute for Biological Sciences in University of Belgrade. And it was the first uh, webinar we had online because at that moment, uh, uh, this coronavirus pandemic uh, started and uh, there was no way uh, of a meeting or gathering in uh, one place and have a live uh, workshop. Uh, so what is the, uh, how it look like? Uh, first of all, uh, we have we start with uh, uh, Naitsa Milkovic's uh, presentation. Uh, she is, uh, as like I said, associate uh, professor and researcher, and uh, she is talk, uh, talking about her experiences with uh, open science in general and uh, open uh, and uh, opening and managing her research data. And uh, it is very interesting for researchers because uh, she is uh, talking about, uh, especially about her early mistakes when uh, she uh, didn't uh, consider much about uh, metadata or uh, for long-term preservation and so on. So it's very interesting for researchers to get familiar with that. And that is something that uh, most of them are not knowingly uh, committing uh, those uh, mistakes. And uh, and also she is talking about benefits of uh, of opening data as, as well, especially. And um, then we talk about uh, uh, research data management in general. Uh, what is it? Uh, how is it uh, done? And uh, we go all the way to uh, uh, to uh, research data data lifecycle from the, the beginning of generating data naming conventions, uh, choosing the right format, uh, backup strategies, so on, so on, until the licenses and, uh, of course, uh, long-term preservation. 
uh, we tackled the issue of uh, fair data principles, uh, and I'm glad that uh, David uh, talked it uh, previously about that, so I don't have to talk about what is fair data. And uh, uh, and also we talk a, a little bit about uh, DMPs, but now we will change it and this format we will talk about DMPs a little bit more because they are more and more required by uh, not just our national funder, but also uh, international European funders like uh, European Commission. Uh, then we talk about a little bit more specific uh, problems like uh, uh, talk, talk a lot about it, uh, of importance of metadata, importance of, of good metadata, good and quality metadata, and also of choosing uh, the right metadata standards and uh, choosing the, the controlled vocabularies where uh, there is a need for that. And also, uh, uh, she talked about uh, practices for um, supple uh, for uh, 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 this supplemental data that covers uh, that goes with articles, and uh, she uh, covers that uh, subject also, and how it is better off to to uh, uh, to uh, send this data in a, a data repository and to link it back to the research article, then to uh, publish. Uh, data in a non-interoperable interoperable way, like uh, just uh, send it as a Word doc uh, uh, attachment or or PDF attachment or similar. And uh, the last one is uh, Liana Lazari. She's a researcher from Institute of Psychology, like I said, and uh, uh, she talks a, a lot of, of uh, she's very important because she is from this side of uh, uh, social sciences uh, background and uh, she talks about uh, a lot of uh, this uh, uh, debunking of myth of uh, open data because a lot of uh, researchers are, are a little bit uh, aware of uh, or scared about, about this uh, opening data and what can happen with that, how uh, they think that uh, probably it will uh, be misused or uh, somebody will, will, will scoop it uh, and uh, use it before them and publish articles before them. So she kind of debunked this, this uh, whole uh, scare of, of open day, opening, opening data. And she's also talking about uh, incentives uh, and uh, a lot of badges and then what can happen to, for uh, researchers to, um, to publish open data and with other things considering open science like the registration and so on. And she's also talking about anonymization process, which is very important for uh, personal data or for uh, data that are, uh, that are uh, in some other way uh, uh, that needs to be uh, anonymized. anonymized. Uh, this all uh, activity, this all uh, good response from uh, our audience uh, gave us a thought to apply for uh, EOS secret Secretariat uh, co-creation activity. We got this project in uh, July 2020, which is called Boosting EOS Readiness, creating a scalable model for capacity building. And it lasted till March this year. Um, the aim was to, uh, to build the capacities to build the infrastructure and uh, to train, especially librarians and uh, decision makers uh, to, uh, to bridge this gap that uh, Western Balkans countries, uh, non-EU Western Balkan countries have uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, following the, the uh, practices that uh, EOSC and the requirements that EOSC uh, wants. So uh, that was our aim. Uh, we had the results uh, like um, uh, website uh, for RDM, uh, you have a link uh, here. And um, the, the website uh, explains that basically what is RDM. It has a lot of examples uh, on how to do it, uh, how to, um, manage data and uh, share data in a, in a good and responsible way. Um, it is written in Serbian, but uh, most of the uh, Western Balkan countries understand uh, or speak that language. 
uh, we also made a data repository in, uh, in the open source uh, dataverse uh, which is just uh, for now uh, a dummy uh, just uh, for showing uh, but uh, and uh, we made the localization of that repository and we now we have a ready infrastructure for for uh, later on if somebody probably university of belgrade starts to uh, to use this uh, repository to we will have infrastructure ready now we also uh, deal with the localization of uh, argos which is open air project uh, uh, it is a machine actionable uh, platform for uh, creating uh, data management plans uh, and also in uh, that kind of uh, uh, task, we uh, did um, uh, kind of template for answering these questions that uh, national funder asked uh, researchers to, to deal with, uh, how to deal with data. So we gave that some kind of a guideline and uh, uh, how to uh, communicate in that way, how to uh, answer those questions. And we, uh, uh, transformed it in uh, in Argos and implemented it, it in Argos. It is still now in beta version, but we are now developing a, a newer, better a template for PhD students. But it will be something so that's something on the way. Uh, also, uh, thing that we consider was uh, open re research data policy. We gave, gave the amendments to national policy considering fair data. Uh, DMPs and so on, and also uh, one of the important things was uh, dissemination and training, uh, especially for uh, librarians and uh, which and especially for to to you know to to spread this uh, network of uh, people engaging in uh, and understanding RDM, and also uh, for decision makers uh, so they can uh, you know uh, they can adjust this national policy and. Um, and uh, probably make uh, these practices more better and more close to European Open Science Cloud. So uh, what are takeaways from this whole experience, uh, especially for uh, workshops that we had? Uh, for, for Well, my kind of advice would be to uh, have a, a researcher with you. It is good to have someone who has experience uh, with uh, uh, data management um, and especially uh, and it is good if you have someone who is uh, who had mistakes before uh, especially with data loss or uh, low quality metadata or something like that uh, but something somebody who is aware of the of it and how bad it can be and uh, now uh, some, that uh, someone is a uh, is uh, more interesting in the, doing this practice in in, uh, uh, in a good way uh, in, uh, uh, on, on, uh, and considered as somebody who is considering uh, fair data principles. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, another advice would be to learn a lot of, on uh, RDM. It is a vast field and uh, it has a lot of topics uh, to discuss, a lot of topics to understand. Um, uh, learn a lot of uh, it, uh, read a lot, uh, talk to people, uh, consider their experiences. And uh, that is a good way to uh, have exchange uh, with, uh, especially with uh, researchers and to uh, build, uh, uh, to change a culture, especially to, to make uh, people uh, uh, look on the librarians in a different way. We, I talk a lot about librarians because here in Serbia, we still don't have this fragmented uh, like uh, in uh, jobs like a data librarian or data steward. We're still in a phase where we are all librarians, research librarians and doing uh, this uh, RDM stuff uh, as we go on. Uh, another advice would be uh, to um, uh, Start uh, one like uh, the proverb say one bite at a time. Just uh, probably provide a general picture on uh, research data management and uh, fair data, and later on you can proceed uh, with uh, more detailed uh, pictures. Okay, so uh, researchers now know uh, what are they uh, required to do now to go to follow re uh, fair data principles and uh, to be. 
responsible in managing data, but uh, how to choose uh, good metadata standard, how to choose control vocabulary or, uh, or license or uh, data repository and uh, how to uh, deal with it uh, as you uh, are doing your research experiment, your research project, uh, and how, uh, how to implement that metadata standard during your research phase. It's an important uh, thing to know uh, and uh, to, to talk about it with researchers and to, to find out uh, how we can help them. Uh, one of the uh, things that we find out uh, uh, was that um, researchers usually uh, confuse data management and fair data principles with opening the, the data. And uh, like I said, uh, there is a lot of concern with opening the data, whether uh, should they open the data? Is it legal? Is it uh, is it uh, smart? Is it advisable to, for them to do that? Uh, so uh, it is very important uh, at the start of your uh, lecture or your, of your workshop to tell them that uh, data manage management doesn't need to be doesn't need to mean that you're opening data. Uh, First of all, concentrate on uh, good and uh, responsible data management following uh, with, uh, with fair principles. And uh, later on, uh, if they choose to open this data, it will be uh, much, uh, it will be of great quality now and, uh, and uh, uh, it will be something uh, that can be reusable in a good matter, matter uh, later on. Um, Another, uh, another advice would be uh, to build infrastructure if you are, uh, if you can, if you have uh, that uh, kind of uh, support uh, to, uh, by your institution. Uh, if you, if, uh, I mean, uh, to build a data repository, especially for, for uh, data. And uh, if you don't have that kind of uh, infrastructure, you don't, if you don't have that kind of ability, uh, you can also, uh, you can still uh, promote uh, uh, data management uh, because uh, it is, uh, there are other ways if you don't have your uh, institutional data repository, you can uh, promote uh, general purpose repositories like Zenodo or Figshare or uh, OSF, or uh, you can use uh, your institutional repository. It is probably not advisable, but you can still use it. Uh, if it is uh, sometimes uh, researchers feel um, kind of relaxed when they use their own their own institutional repository for things like that for, uh, uh, they feel uh, more relaxed because they now know that their data is safe within their own country their own institution not on some far away servers uh, that they don't have control of uh, uh, but this is considering that your institutional repository or data repository is, is uh, is standardized, is uh, well maintained, and you have uh, 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 support staff that is uh, uh, doing to do uh, everything uh, so it can be uh, of good quality. Also, uh, uh, one of the things that we found out that uh, researchers uh, are, uh, this is something that we, you will face in uh, literature uh, probably everywhere. Uh, researchers found this uh, data management, especially writing data management plans and doing uh, responsible data management and sharing fair data, everything as additional, especially administrative burden to their work. And uh, this is something uh, more for them to, uh, to now uh, deal with. So uh, it is good to, to give them some kind of incentives. Uh, it could be, it would be great if there uh, if your institution uh, has a system of rewarding the kind of uh, of um, endeavor. Uh, it would be good uh, for uh, for it, if it is rewardable for uh, for uh, uh, promotion and uh, and so on. And but if you don't have that kind of uh, 
incentive, uh, you can also um, create a list of open data champions. Sometimes it is very good for people to know that they are in front in front of uh, something, especially if something is good like uh, like uh, data management and sharing. Also, uh, I would like to suggest to build uh, websites, uh, build the guidelines, build, uh, build create brochures or pamphlets or something that will promote this kind of activity and uh, and promote uh, your library uh, uh, as a as a mean uh, uh, as a service that uh, researchers can look upon for help or uh, for some kind of other discussion it is good uh, because uh, you are not always around uh, and probably somebody wants to find out more about uh, some topic that you probably don't have an answer so it's very good to to, uh, to have something like that where you can uh, direct your uh, researchers uh, for uh, for additional literature or uh, advice uh, also uh, when you are, if you are still starting with this, uh, consider to start small, probably with one department or uh, one uh, research group. Uh, start small, uh, uh, and uh, you will learn along the way because we are. Uh, it is one of the way to for our us librarians to be involved in a research research process, and um, most of us don't know this. Uh, uh, how are uh, how uh, researchers are doing their research and uh, so but we we do have a knowledge on something else that probably most of them uh, don't have it, it and it is uh, knowledge of uh, metadata which is something with, that we do probably all the time with repositories with uh, catalogizing catalogizing uh, books and and journals and uh, so on. So th these are uh, uh, these are skills and knowledge that we have that we can implement and uh, we can show to our researchers, and uh, they will uh, have uh, uh, they will have uh, our gratitude for that. And uh, uh, also, my last advice uh, this would be to prepare yourself. Uh, there will be a lot of questions. And uh, probably on some of them, you will not have answer, but it is good to uh, give uh, them uh, your uh, contact to know that you are there to help them. And uh, so you can, uh, uh, you, you, it is very important to you, uh, for you to have this, uh, to start this communication with uh, the researchers. And, uh, and it is good for them to recognize you as one of the uh, integral part of their research process. So I hope uh, I again <laughs> uh, roof this uh, this uh, my webinar. But thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you can I'll stop sharing now. And I hope you will have questions later on so thank you thanks a lot Obrat, sir that was excellent sir and um, i really like your approach that you have uh, a team uh, which is uh, which goes beyond uh, an institution so it's like a national team supporting each other and um, i think that's it, it would be good if there are such teams in the countries and uh, Theodosia wrote in the chat what, what I wanted to suggest. Uh, maybe that's something we, we could also do in Eiffel for, for those who are starting with research data management and uh, don't have uh, people in their countries to, to consult with yet. Uh, so I'll, uh, when I'll be following up uh, about this webinar, I'll um, include that and if you want to be part of uh, that RDM team in Eiffel, uh, let, let's try how that works. Uh, and there is a question from Theodosia about the role of libraries, but I suggest to take it after Samuel's presentation because uh, his talk about uh, game-based learning is also very interesting. Uh, so over to you, Samuel. Mm -hmm. uh, should, should I answer it uh, right now? Uh, 
let's maybe do it after after oh, Samuel's okay. presentation and okay. uh, maybe also David and Samuel could add uh, to that because it's about role of the library in um, open science, uh, embedding open science in an institution, especially if a librarian isn't on the managerial position. Okay. So let's let's take it after and uh, over to you, Samuel. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Irina. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Please confirm if you can see it. Yes. Yes, I can see it. Great. Um, let me just minimize that. All right. So <clears throat> my name is um, Samus Mangle, and I'm the manager of research data services at Stellenbosch University's library. Uh, my presentation will actually be about the research data uh, management adventure game that was recently launched at Southern Bush um, University. And my talk is, general, is basically about research data management skills development through game-based learning with a core focus being on the RDM adventure game. Um, in terms of the uh, outline of this presentation, I'll provide a synopsis of the game, the aim of the game, I'll describe the gameplay, some possible use cases, and then there will be a short demonstration of the game itself. Now, at the outset, I would just like to point out that the game represents a collaboration between the University of Bath on the one hand and the University of Stellenbosch University on the other hand, um, particularly in um, respect to the university's um, academic um, libraries. Um, <clears throat> so, the game itself um, is a text-based role-playing interactive fiction series game based on the RDM, um, based on data management challenges of a research project. The game takes the form of an online choose your own adventure format in which game players take a simulated research project through the following processes, data management planning, data collection or generation, data organization, data description, and research publication while encountering data management challenges along the way. Now, as I pointed out, the game is a collaboration between the University of Bath and Stellenbosch University. The game was developed between 2017 and 2020 by um, Alex Ball from the University of Bath, myself, and Nushrat Khan, who at that time was working at the University of Bath. Now, the, uh, the game was launched in December 2020 by the University of Bath, and then it was launched at Stellenbosch University um, in March of this year. Now, what happened in January of this year, in January of this year, um, the Welcome Trust actually recognized, the, actually endorsed the game by including it um, in the Welcome Open Research Early Career Researchers Pack, therefore recognizing it as a useful tool for researchers. And then very recently, the game was endorsed by the Open Researchers, the Open Research Funders Group, that is the ORFG, which actually added the game on the organization's policy implementation tools webpage. Now, for those of you who might not know, the ORFG's membership consists of several reputable research funders. So this was actually a good um, seal of approval, if I can put it that way. Now, <clears throat> In terms of its aims, um, the objective of the game is to demonstrate and teach good research practice in research data management and to assist researchers in understanding good practices of RDM, which is research data management. The specific learning outcomes of the game focus on the following aspects, data management planning, designing participant information sheets and consent forms, choosing appropriate equipment for research projects, acquiring suitable third-party research data, organizing research data, storing research data appropriately, analyzing and documenting research data, preparing research data for archiving, and publishing research data. So as you can see on the slide here, got the iceberg, um, which shows the tip of the iceberg, which is what the RGM game actually covers. But if you look at it at a deeper level, what researchers learn about are data management planning concepts, data literacy and data archiving, which are the core components to a large degree of research data management. 
Now, in terms of the audience itself, the game is aimed primarily at postgraduate students as well as early career researchers and academics. However, anyone who has an interest in understanding research data management and how it works on a practical level, for example, research support staff, could actually find this game to be very beneficial. Now, now for the gameplay. Um, the game actually takes players through different stages of the research data lifecycle. It presents them with a data management planning challenge and allows them to make decisions that affect the success of their research project. Players progress either by making straightforward binary choices or by completing puzzle-like options. In the process, certain challenges test the effectiveness of the decisions made by the players. The tone of the game is lighthearted in order to maintain its entertainment value, despite it being a serious game. Since the game simulates the entire RDM lifecycle, the repercussions of decisions that researchers make can be experienced in a safe environment, permitting them to make mistakes and hopefully learn from them without suffering the associated real life consequences. Game players can opt to play the entire game or can select to only play specific stages of the RDM lifecycle. So how exactly can the game be played? Or rather, how could it be used? There are two um, use cases uh, I can think of. On the one hand, we have um, virtual training. So this is something that we thought of long before the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's how the game was actually designed, so that it can actually be used for um, asynchronous training, so that you wouldn't always need to have a trainer training researchers um, about research data um, management. If there are any questions relating to the game, then the researchers would be free to contact um, any RGM specialist at an institution. On the other hand, there's also the aspect of interactive uh, training. Now, under such a scenario, the game could actually be used in conjunction with um, other types of training. So you could actually have the game being paired with lessons on something such as uh, data management planning or data archiving, in which case the game would actually serve as a summative evaluation tool. Now, thus far, um, as of yesterday, the game has actually been accessed by 713 users in 42 countries. Now, I should point out that the game is actually treated as a universal game, even though it was actually launched by or developed and launched by Southern Boston University and the University of Bath. This does not necessarily restrict it to the researchers or staff members from those two um, institutions. Anyone across the world can actually access this game. There's no need to actually authenticate or log in in order to um, make use of the game. You simply need to have access to the internet, you need access to a browser, and need to um, have the ability to understand English um, because the game is actually written um, in English. Um, there are possibilities to actually have it translated um, in the future, but I won't go into any of those details at the moment. I'll just describe the game as it exists at the current uh, moment. All right, so now let's go to the actual demonstration itself. Let's just move this out of the way. All right, so now what you see um, on your screen should be the game's landing page, um, the icon which I actually just clicked on right now. Now, what you'll see is that the game prompts you to resume an earlier game, and I'll describe that later, or to start a new game. In this case, we're going to start with a new game. I'm sorry, Samuel, we're still seeing your slides. Yes. Are you so still maybe, seeing my slides? Mm -hmm. So maybe you, you can uh, stop sharing and then share again. All right, sure. A different screen. All right. Um, okay. Um, I think you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Now, now we can see the game. All right, so this is the game's um, landing page. So what I'll do now is I'll start with a new game here. And once you click that, you're given the options of playing as a qualitative researcher, working with human participants, or as an experimental researcher, um, essentially 
dealing with what would be viewed as quantitative um, research. So I'm just going to select the qualitative option just for demonstration purposes. And you have the option of either going through a quick introduction of how the game is played, or you can jump straight into the game. Now for demonstration purposes, I'm actually going to walk everyone through the introduction itself rather than playing the game. I'll leave that to you so that you can actually get to play the game on your own. But what I want to do is sort of like whet your appetite. So in terms of the um, tutorial itself, what is explained is that the game makes use of several um, link and options. So you can actually see links that allow you to cycle through several options. As you can see here, if you click this link, you can see the second option, or you can see the third option if you click the link, or you can see the first option again. And then at the bottom, if this is the case, you'd see a link that allows you to fix that choice. And if you click that, then this is the option that will be selected. So it is noticed that you actually went for the third option in this case. Now, what you'll find is that there is also a second type of link that you'll find. And this is a link that actually um, expands the text that you can see once you click it. So here's the example. If I click this, you'll see that the text that's available is actually expanded for you to actually read more content. Now, moving further down the web page, you can see that there's an option of choices. Now, we have food choices here. That's not going to be the case in the actual game itself, but this is a tutorial, so we decided to have some fun with it. In this case, there's a food buffet, and we have rice food items that you can either select or leave behind. So I'm going to actually select the first three, the ham sandwich, the vegan wrap, the salad, leave the crisps, the apple, and the fruitcake. And that would actually allow me to select this. So in the actual game, you would actually be selecting several options or leaving several options behind as well. Now, if you decide to actually um, reselect your options and think that you probably made a mistake, you can do that by simply refreshing the web page. So I'm going to do that right now. And once the web page has actually been refreshed, you should actually see all the options reappearing once again. Um, so I'll make different selections this time. <clears throat> I'll select everything except for the fruit cake in this case. So take that, take that, take that, take that, and we'll leave the fruit cake. And then we're ready to move on. Now, once you click the link, you'll notice that your options that you've selected will actually be reflected to you um, on the screen itself. As you can see, we've got everything there except for the fruit cake. And then comes the next type of um, links that actually um, exist. So there are some options sometimes where you'll find options that appear to be equally um, promising. Uh, this is just to make the game slightly difficult. So in this case, what you'll find is that someone could be given the option of looking out of a round window. This is just for demonstration purposes, once again. So if you look out of the round window, you'll see a geodesic dome. If you look out of the square window, you'll see a tower block. If you look out of the triangular window, you would see a pyramid. There's nothing to say which one of these is actually bound to be the most correct one, or at least it's not so obvious. And that's what the game tries to do, to teach people instead of spoon feeding them. So if we move forward, you'll see that we can actually see a pyramid as the option, as the third option. Now, the next thing that I want to discuss is the scoring. So you do have links to the scoring if you want to track your scoring. And what you could do is you can click the score link and you would see your score. Now, since this is a demo, there are no uh, points that are actually allocated. So you'll see that your score is zero out of a possible zero. This is just to indicate that you that during the actual gameplay, you'd see your actual score and the maximum number of points that you could have possibly accumulated. Now, each time you actually, um, you either have positive points um, awarded to you, or you'd get a zero, in which case you won't get any points added or any points deducted, or in some cases you find points will be deducted. After reviewing your score, you can click resume playing to return back to the game. Now, I should point out that as you play the game, if you look down at the very bottom, you'd actually be able to see your score as well here being tallied up, but you obviously wouldn't be able to see the maximum score. So that's why you can actually click the icon, the link in order to see um, the maximum number of points. You can also track your progress by viewing the progress bar. This is an active um, in, in the tutorial itself, but during the game, this would actually um, be active. And as you progress during the game, these um, circles would actually become black dots. And your ranking would also change as well. In this case, the players are ranked during the tutorial, but as you play the game, you'll see that your ranking would actually change, especially as you become better. And you also have the option 
option of restarting the game by clicking on the restart link. I won't click this because it would undo everything that we've done thus far, and then we'd actually have to restart everything from scratch. Now, the last thing that um, I want to point out on um, this page is that it is possible in terms of the links to actually undo what you've done, or at least to go back to the previous page if you want to make different choices. So you could go back here and you could go back again and look out of a different window, or you can actually go forward again. So it's almost as if you were undoing and redoing um, your content um, on a, let's say, a Word document in this case, but you can only go forward so far as the last or the furthest point that you've actually reached. Now, before I move on to the next page, I do want to point out that the game does actually um, save the gameplay within the actual browser. So what you can do is you can actually stop playing the game and then return later. But this is only possible if you decide to not clear um, the cookies in your browser. So the game will actually be saved in your browser. So I'm going to provide you with a demonstration of how this works. Um, I'm going to actually close the game. And then I'm going to try to go back to the game once again. Now, what you see is that you will actually arrive at the game's landing page and the game will prompt you to either start a new game or to resume an earlier game, which has actually been saved in the browser. And if you take this option, select resume your earlier game, you will actually go back to the last place that you were at during the game. And as you can see, this is the web page that we left off at. And then the last link would be to start, or at least to go to the next page. And in this case, what I want to point out is that as you play the game, sometimes you will actually see some text that is actually, uh, that has blue dotted lines um, underneath, such as Jabberwock in this case. So if I was to click that, it would mean that Jabberwock is a term that has actually been defined. And I can see the definition by clicking on the term. And in this case, Jabberwock is defined as a mythical creature invented by Lewis Carroll, often pictured as a particularly grotesque dragon. And then you click on OK to return back to the game. So we thought that this was important for certain terms that researchers might not necessarily be familiar with. So we did define some of the terms um, in the game. And then there's one last decision that would actually have to be made by a game player, and that is how to actually start the game. So as I pointed out earlier on, you can play the game in, in its entirety by starting from level one all the way up to level five. So you apply for your funding, then you start working on the project, you get to organize your data files, describe your data sets and publish your work. Um, or you can simply select which level you want to play. Do you want to describe your data first or do you want to start working on your project or do you only want to work on uh, applying for funding which would actually relate to um, data uh, management plans. Um, I should just also point out that um, before I finish off that in terms of organizing your data files, this not only has to do with file naming conventions and organizing files, but it also deals with data storage. It's just that it's not so obvious when you look at the name of the, um, the actual level um, itself. And that's pretty much it in terms of a demo. As I pointed out, I will not go through the live game itself. You're free to actually play it on your own and find out how it works. I just wanted to give you a broad idea of the game mechanics and how that actually functions. But you can rest assured that none of the content in the tutorial is actually reflected in the game itself. The game is really about resource data management. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Samuel. It's excellent, and uh, I played the game and I loved it. Uh, and uh, what I also like is that uh, it's text-based, so it's really optimized for connectivity issues. So I think that's very useful. Um, there is one question to you in a chat, and uh, I'll read it to you. It's from Theodosia. Thank you, Samuel. This looks interesting. How long would it normally take to play the game? That's an interesting question. Um, it really, uh, it really depends on um, the choices that a game player makes. So the game has eight possible outcomes, meaning that there are different paths that you can take to the end. But what we did is we did have a, um, a beta uh, testing phase before we lost the game. So we did our alpha testing and our beta testing. And the average time that it took for people to play the entire game was roughly one hour. So it was about 55 minutes to one hour and five minutes was the range. So we just put it at one hour. But if you play the individual levels, they'll obviously take less time. And depending on which path you take, um, 
but in its entirety, the game will take you about 55 minutes to um, six, 55 to 65 minutes. So we averaged it out at one hour. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have two questions and I, I understand that we went over time. Apologies for that, sir. And um, I understand if, if you need to leave, uh, please please leave, uh, but if, if you could stay for, for another five minutes, uh, let's maybe take questions. So there is one question from Vidya about uh, accessing data free of charge, um, and I put in a link in the chat to read data repository, which is a di directory of data repositories, and you can figure out uh, which, uh, which data is, avail is available for free when you are searching. And if others know other useful links to getting access to data without any costs, please share them in the chat. And I would like to take this question from Theodosia. What role does a librarian play in embedding open science, especially if you're not in management and uh, you're all librarians and uh, you all play the role? So it would be great if, if you could uh, respond to that question. Well, I think I, I echo something up of that uh, said, which was to start small, uh, to perhaps identify a, a research uh, team or a particular de department that is uh, engaged in uh, with open data, and you can turn them into a champion. And also, of course, uh, advocacy in ter terms of uh, the senior management of your institution. So you may not be senior management yourselves, but uh, you can influence the senior managers. Uh, working with the committee structure of your institution, if there is a research committee or if individual uh, faculties have research committees, then try to infiltrate these and to get uh, open science uh, accepted that as uh, a, a part of part of people's day-to-day -day work. So that's uh, some of the uh, directions that I would take. Thanks. How would you answer that, Obrad and Samuel? Um, well, I agree uh, with David. That is a good way. And, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think that uh, it is very important for librarians to be involved, uh, probably from the beginning, in this whole process, uh, because uh, we had uh, this unfortunate uh, accident uh, with our national uh, funder, because uh, when they were um, implementing this uh, DMPs, uh, like I said previously in my presentation, last year, uh, they uh, um, kind of, uh, Ask uh, uh, certain questions of, for from uh, for uh, researchers. What will they do with their uh, research data? What types will they use? Uh, will they will it be generated data or uh, used from another sources or so on? But uh, none of the questions dealt with uh, metadata. Nothing about that. And uh, as far as I remember. Nothing uh, was uh, there about the long-term preservation thing. I mean, or license and so on. Very important things. And uh, I think if a librarian, even a librarian who doesn't have a knowledge on research data management would be aware that there are such uh, things and that, that it should be, uh, that it shouldn't be overlooked. So I think it's very important. One of the ways is to uh, uh, to uh, promote yourself, to promote your uh, knowledge, to promote your skills, and eventually, uh, I I'm sure about it that uh, uh, somebody from uh, higher structures of your institution will get notice to you, and uh, eventually they will ask you to join and to uh, advise them in, in uh, such a way. So if you are doing uh, good library work, if you are, uh, especially if you are uh, learning uh, research data management uh, and, and teaching research data management to other researchers, I think it's important to also promote that 
uh, your work so others can hear you and uh, and know when they can contact you for help. Thanks. Anything to add, Samuel, from, from your experience? Um, Irina, can you just repeat the, the question? Um, I missed a bit of it. Uh, what role does a librarian play in embedding open science, especially if you're not in the management, or if that librarian is, is not sir, in the university management, sir? Well, that's okay, because I, I have another question for you. Well, I would say it's more of a, the, so there is a advocacy and training um, component that, um, that the um, librarian would actually play if they're not necessarily um, high up. Now, it obviously does depend on the structure that you have at your institution. If you have, let's say, subject or faculty librarians, then they may actually be more embedded than the RDM librarian. But the idea is to actually um, be an advocate of resource data management as well as um, open science um, within the resource community on the one hand. And secondly, to see if you can either provide training or um, assist researchers in upskilling and learning about the various aspects of resource data management. Um, this is just um, in a very broad manner. And thirdly, I say creating some kind of content that you can um, that you can sort of like um, direct researchers to. So by way of example, I'm not necessarily in senior management at, at our institution, but we've created something such as the game which um, can draw researchers to it without necessarily us having to go to them um, on a regular basis. So I put it down to either training, creating some kind of content, and advocacy. Those are the three roles that I could actually single out. Thanks a lot, sir. Ellen also has a question to you, Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. I just checked out the game, really informative and also fun. My question is, is a content license under an open license? Would it be possible for other libraries to use some of the text to develop a game uh, of their own? Um, that's actually a very good question. I noticed that it's something that I actually forgot to mention in my presentation. Um, the game has actually been um, released under a Creative Commons license. That's the CC by NCSA um, license. And the game um, source code is actually hosted on GitLab. So it would be possible to actually um, um, adopt it at an institutional level. Um, we probably wouldn't be hands-on in terms of like, being involved in assisting with that. Um, but by way of example, for instance, um, someone did inquire about translating it um, at a previous session that I had. Um, and they inquired about um, translating it to French and then someone inquired about Spanish. Um, and the whole thing was that it could be possible, it, but um, without going into the technical aspects, the idea is that if we wanted to have the analytics in one page, like in at one um, platform, we use Google Analytics to track um, the game's analytics we could have it on GitLab um, and have sort of like subfolders um, for the game. That's possible for the languages, but when you start looking at people trying to adopt it at an institution level, it becomes a bit tricky. We have had a query from um, Reading University about um, possibly adapting the game when just changing the content at the end so that you can direct users to Reading University's resources as opposed to Stellenbosch University's or Baths resources, which is the default. And that would probably be tricky because you might have more institutions that want to do that. But I have put this question through to my colleague, Alex Ball, and he did give me a response um, a few days ago. Um, if you email me, I can share that, um, um, that, that, that email response. But it suffices to point out that any institution could go out there, use the source code and customize it. Um, you'd have to give us some kind of um, attribution as per the license though. But as I pointed out, this is an open license that certainly does permit it. It just means that the analytics would sort of like fall away if an institution decides it to adopt it on its own. We have no control of that, but it is permissible in terms of, uh, of the license. But I would certainly like to talk further with you um, about any possible plans that you'd have about wanting to adopt this game. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And let's let's take the last question. Now it's from Sarah. 
Uh, research data management is an area of interest to librarians, especially in academic libraries, in order to contribute effectively in learning and research in universities. However, most librarians fear to get involved with this because they may feel they do not have the necessary skills. What would you advise? Um, how, how did you get involved? How did you learn all, all those skills? Uh, may I start? Uh... Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, there are courses, uh, uh, online courses with this. Uh, I think uh, Coursera has one, which is uh, very, very good uh, on uh, RDM and sharing. And uh, that is the first part where a librarian can learn something uh, about uh, research data management and sharing. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is that uh, you do have, as a librarian, you do have uh, necessary skills, as you said, because uh, you are already doing uh, some kind of metadata input, whether you are cataloging books or, or uh, you are inputting uh, works in uh, your repository and also probably, I don't know, uh, some of you have a, a necessary knowledge in, in, a, in a teaching and educating. And I think uh, that, uh, of course, uh, there is also one uh, probably misconception of, of how we perceive uh, uh, researchers as they are the most intelligent people in the world and that they they know everything in, in, there is about in, in this world. So it is uh, not like that. I mean, especially with things uh, like this. I mean, uh, I, uh, something that I found out that uh, there are a lot of things uh, they don't understand, especially with the requirements, uh, especially concerned uh, with uh, metadata and also control vocabularies. That is something that they don't probably use as often. They, probably uh, 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 they probably uh, found it out in, in, in their research process, but they didn't use it. They didn't find it necessary uh, to, to use and uh, to all the time and so on. So I think that librarians do have skills. You just have to figure out which skills you do have, some skills you will have to learn, but it is nothing uh, for, a, I think I'm talking for a general, research data management, not for a subject specific. And uh, that is more, uh, it is more for uh, somebody who has a, a research background. It is more helpful, helpful. It doesn't mean that you don't have uh, opportunity or, or uh, any chance to learn uh, that. But uh, for uh, some general research data management, I think that librarians do have skills. And uh, uh, probably the best advice would be to, uh, like I said, to start small, um, try to, uh, to target or, or find some, some research group, some small group probably that are very good in communicating uh, with you and, uh, they, uh, and that they find you, uh, um, and that they can register you as somebody who can help them and uh, that you have some skills that can they uh, can utilize uh, you and uh, as a librarian and from that you will go to the next uh, bigger research group and department and so on and uh, probably that's the, the 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 probably that's the best way to to start so start small and uh, don't be afraid i mean uh, if you uh, talk with them, you will find out that there are a lot of things that you know and they do not know and they are eager to find out. So just uh, go for it. Thanks a lot. Uh, there are also a lot of useful resources uh, in the CIFL's Digital Research Literacy Guide for librarians. So I'm pasting a link once again in the chat. Um, Anything to add on that, Samuel or David? Uh... No, I, I, I was just going to uh, endorse the uh, training program that uh, IFO has uh, has developed, as including a lot of excellent materials. Uh, and for instance, the, the um, Edinburgh University uh, book on uh, research technology uh, would be an excellent starting point. 
Uh, the other thing perhaps to remember is that, uh, and I think this, is, this uh, reflects something that Abrad was saying, uh, is that you're, you're, you're part of a team. Uh, there is the researchers involved, obviously, but there are also the IT professionals. Uh, and uh, the skills that are needed are probably going to be contributed by a number of people, not just one person. But, uh, and again, yes, uh, metadata and so forth, there are a lot of skills and not just hard skills, but soft skills that librarians have, which can be uh, very useful, usefully exploited. Um, Irina, if I can just add um, to uh, <clears throat> David's um, response, um, I, I do think that um, in, in addition to uh, things such as uh, courses that have mentioned, I think IFO has such um, resources. There are things such as um, the Research Data Management Librarian Academy run by Harvard or um, Mantra, which is hosted by Edinburgh University. Um, but in addition to that, there are skills that librarians um, already have. Like if you were to say, what's a good starting point? I'd say, pick up a book, but that's just a personal opinion. There's so many books on research data management that I've had to read, but that's specifically because it's part of my job. And not everyone who supports research data management is a data librarian or research data manager. Some of them may actually be metadata librarians, and there are certain skills that they already have relating to the creation of uh, metadata, even if it's at a more generic level, but that allows them to understand the concepts that apply to more domain specific um, ontologies, which is what would be required in that case. Um, and then you'd have information retrieval skills that librarians already have, which can be translated to data discovery, et cetera, things of that nature. So it really depends on what type of librarian you're dealing with. Is it um, information specialist? Was it a metadata librarian? Is it um, someone who's trying to be a data librarian? In which case they would focus more on the um, computational um, aspects or software aspects, and then look at what kind of skills that they're trying to develop. Is it collection-based skills, data manipulation, or managing or organizing data, or creating um, research data, or archiving it? Because if someone already works with repositories, then they would have some of those skills that are already needed um, to work with research data repositories, by way of example. Um, that's my two, two cents in, in a nutshell. Thanks a lot, sir. Let's take the really last question and then we'll, we'll end the webinar. Apologies that we went over time. It's again to Samuel from Richard. Is the game uh, customized for a particular project needs or uh, is it uh, general that anyone could use? Um, the game is basic. It's a generalized game. So um, the way I would describe it is like this. Um, it's supposed to cover different types of research. So that's why um, it's a choose your own adventure game. So what I showed you um, shows that when you start the first level, you would cover the data management planning phase, which is what everyone goes through. But beyond that, the game actually splits off into various paths. So that would be based on whether you're doing qualitative research that involves reusing already existing research data, or if you're conducting experiments, and it doesn't matter which domain they'll be from, we'd actually have to generalize that and just say that you're going to be dealing with some kind of equipment. Or if you're actually conducting research that involves human participants, in which case you would need some kind of ethical clearance. So it generalizes at a very broad level, simply because some of those concepts can be applied to several disciplines but it really covers everything um, in a general manner. But it wouldn't be specific enough to say that this is a project um, being undertaken by someone in let's say forestry per se, or physics or biochemistry, but you'd be able to see that someone in forestry who's actually conducting experiments would actually be able to play the game. And let's say someone in um, medical health sciences would actually be able to have a look at the level that uh, the path that requires um, ethical clearance for making use of human participants in the research. Thank you so much. And thanks again, uh, David, Albert, Samuel. That was excellent. Uh, and thank you, colleagues, for attending and for, for staying with us. Uh, and uh, apologies for, for going over time. Uh, so next Wednesday, we'll talk about uh, writing data management plans and uh, 
training uh, researchers and students about that. Sir. And this webinar will be with David and uh, with sir, our colleague Hieva from uh, Lithuania. And I put a, the link in the chat sir, to register for that next week webinar. And I also put a link uh, to a page where we post all past uh, webinar slides and recording and also announce forthcoming webinars. So we'll be running uh, this series of webinars to support our resource uh, until the end of June. So there will be many more uh, coming and uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good uh, afternoon, evening. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, I'll follow up via email with everyone with recording and uh, slides link and also with this idea to, to set up a uh, research data management support team in Eiffel. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.